Blackfriars production of Sweeney Todd, The Demon Barber of Fleet Street. Please turn off all cell phones and beepers. Um, there will be no flash photography, and there will be a 15 minute intermission. And now a curtain warmer. Just reward for labor. The amount, fool, the amount. 
seven pounds, eighteen shillings, and nine pence half penny. And what may the nine pence half penny be for, Mr. Smith? For one pound of ten inch nails. Are you aware, Mrs. Smith, there are certain parties who may find nine pence half penny a little excessive for a mere pound of ten inch nails? It has occurred to me that I don't like your manner of haggling. Be pleased to pay me this minute and let me go. This individual annoys me. I dislike his manner of grabbing money. In fact, I think him mean. My gorge rises. With the greatest pleasure in the world, I would polish him off. Come a little nearer, Mrs. Smith. Just a little nearer. Come on. There, now. We can talk more like friends, can we not? Do you say so, Mr. Tom? Now, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll make it a guinea and a half, and a free shave, too, afterwards. Has it occurred to you that there are certain parties not very far from the street certain legal parsons who would gain a good deal of profit and the instruction from some of the items and specifications in this little account of mine. What do you mean to imply by those remarks, Mr. Smith? I know of a place that perhaps we might call a school that's filled with individuals who keep little bills like this one in their school books. Do you know who I refer, Mr. Todd? I neither know nor care one jot, Mr. Smith. I am of the opinion that you are out of your mind. Out of your mind. I was never saying her. You know full well the place I have in mind. The Old Bailey, Mr. Todd. The Old Bailey. That's your quiet me. I think. Now, oh, speaking of a free shave, Mr. Smith, now that I get a closer look at you, I discern a certain roughness about your lip and hairiness about your throat that makes my razor long to be at it. So come along, Mrs. Smith, and I shall be polished off in no time at all. Sweeney Todd the barber, and with him thus I harbor. When I've got him in my chair, I'll do more than cut his hair. He'll find out to do his cost. All he earned in life is lost. Oh, 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 I'm always your mom. Oh, 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 I'm always your mom. He's got a lovely throat for a razor. Oh, 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 I'm always your mom. I'm Sweeney Todd the barber. Wicked thoughts I harbor. He will wait for me to begin to operate upon his chin. But to me, that's not my will. Shaving doesn't pay the bill. No, 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 I polish him off. Oh, I polish him off. No, no, I polish him off. Oh, I polish him off. Wave on such lovely throats for a razor. So, 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 I polish him off. I'm swinging hard the ball. He will wish he'd stay When he likes that I'm starting I will expedite starting Yo, ho, ho, I polish him off Oh, ho, ho, I polish him off Oh, ho, ho, I polish him off Yo, ho, ho, I polish him off He's got a lovely throat for a razor Ho, 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 I polish him off Polish him off Ha! Mr. Mechanic, if you could wait but a moment or two, we shall be free to seal up the bargain, eh? Oh, good morning to you, Mr. Todd. Good morning, Mrs. Rag. I see you brought me the little whelp. <gasps> it ain't a little whelp, Mr. Todd, and I won't have you call him so. That I won't. Oh, it's only my idea of a joke, Mr. Rag. Uh, you know how I deal with other jests. Oh, yes, yes, that is, that may be, Mr. Todd. All I know is that I have brought you, my boy, to buy it. Be your apprentice, as you said you would have in that legend. Well, here he is. I want it more, Mr. Todd. I have you to remember that he's a very delicate boy, not to look him too hard. He comes from a very delicate family, he says, and is, well, very easily upset. Ain't you, my little lamb? Oh, yes. Please, more. And I'd like to ask you likewise, Mr. Todd, that my little Tobias has been tenderly nurtured, and to please treat him as such. That goes without the necessity of saying, Mr. Ryan. I doubt if we could find a kinder, more gentler employer in the length and breadth of the city of London. So go along now, I'll treat your boys. I would my own son as he deserves, oh. you can be sure. So go along, no worries, Mrs. Ryan, none at all. As you say, sir, Miss Widger says good morning. Please up to you, Mr. Todd. Come a little closer, my friend. Ah! Ah! 
No, listen to this. And hear me well, Miss uh, Tobias. You are my apprentice, and you have me boarding, lodging, and watch. Do you understand? Why, yes, sir. Say that you will to take your meals at home. Don't sleep here, and make sure your mother keeps up your own linen. Then, aren't you a fortunate, happy dog? Yes, Mr. Todd. Yes, Mr. Todd. What, Mr. Todd? A tired boy. I'm a happy, fortunate dog, Mr. Todd. I'm I can tell you and I are going to get along quite well. But if you make one remark, any supposition when it goes on in this shop, by God, I'll cut your throat from ear to ear. Oh, Mr. Todd! Not, oh, Mr. Todd! But no, Mr. Todd, no, I won't make any supposition or draw any conclusion when I see you in the shop. <laughs> but why, yes, Mr. Todd, I won't say a word, Mr. Todd. If I do, may I be made into veal pies at Mrs. Lovett's in Bell Yard. What did you say, boy? Veal pies, Mr. Todd. How dare you mention veal pies in my presence, boy? Does he suspect? Tell me, boy, you suspect! Oh, no, Mr. Todd, I just clicked the thing, sir. I meant no harm in making the remarks, sir. Very well. I am content. Tobias, if a customer gives you a penny, you can keep it, my boy. You can keep it. Why, thank you, sir. When you, be a, when you get enough pennies, you'll be a rich man, won't you, Tobias? Why, yes, sir. That's very kind of you, sir. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll be even kinder. When that customer decides to give you a penny, I'll keep it for you. Save them up and, and dispatch them, I think you require. Why, thank you, Mr. Tall. That's very kind. Who was this? His clothing, the manner of speaking, the barren seafaring man, and a stranger in these parts. Uh, Miss Mechanic, I swear you must have other appointments on the other side of town. So maybe if you come back sometime early next week, we can see other deal, eh? Very well, I will go. But I'll be back earlier than next week. Much earlier than next week. Well, my boy, I thank you for your wonderful information. So you do say you know a Miss Joanna Oakley? Why, yes, I'm acquainted with Miss Joanna. My father died a year ago. Sickness and sorrow became my poor mother and I. Had it not been for Miss Oakley's timely aid, both of us might have perished for want. How glad it's a person's heart to you, sweetheart, so highly esteemed. Miss Joanna Oakley is my half fiance's brother. But for five years now, I've been absent from the country that I love so well. My vessel unexpectedly arrived at the port this morning, and no sooner had I stepped foot on shore, but I felt a desire to seek out my old friends. But judge of my mortification and surprise, that they were not known at their former addresses, but had removed and no one knew whither. Uh, heaven alone knows how I should have been able to find them. Had an opt for your time to aid. Oh, how I would love to become a sailor. Oh, how we enjoy some life, freedom, breathing in the fresh, pure air of my liberty. Sailing away, sailing way over the sea. Sailing away, joyous and happy and free. White clouds above, floating along in the blue. Air. No need for care, sailing way over 
And during that time, I have saved well over 10,000 pounds. Besides being the possessor of a string of pearls. A string of pearls? Worth 12,000 more. Tobias, my boy, what do you do? Stop. I was just... But I gave you strict instruction not to speak to any customer while out of my sight. You may have done so that I... Ah! Take that and remember what it was for. Now go to the shop and finish your job at once. Yes, sir. At once, sir. Your pardon, sir. I'm very angry. Boy, you see, I have some for the address of a particularly old friend. No, no, no apologies necessary, my friend. I love that boy, as I would my own son. However, a little mild chastisement does him no harm. Perhaps you are right, but I must always protest against severity towards young persons. I am going to meet my sweetheart presently, and I believe a clean face will become important for such an occasion. Is it a shave you need? <laughs> what am I here for but to give you a shave? Come along, sir, and I shall have you polished off in no time at all. Please, sir, don't go in, sir, don't go in! Tobias, while I'm operating on this man's chin, I think that the Figures of St. Dunstan's clock are about to ring. The exhibition will excite your curiosity and leave me to shame the man without interruption. But please, sir, can't I? And aren't you what, boy? Can't I stay and bother him? Get out, I say, get out! I love that boy. Positively dirt <laughs> on him. However, <laughs> we must get along, sir. So go along. I'll have you polished off in no time at all.
disorganized in some form or fashion. And remember, sweetie, the string of pearls. The string of pearls. When a boy, I was first awakened from the thirst of avarice by the gift of a father. That farthing soon a pound, that pound, one hundred pounds, that hundred pounds, soon to be a thousand pounds, and I swore to myself I would possess one hundred thousand pounds, and the string of pearls would complete the sun. Who's there?
sense and token of your existence and of your continual love. Mirrors, the slightest word would have been sufficient. Mother's voice. You better not be seen at present. 
that you forget that some strings are of great value. I myself have seen these pearls you speak of, and can assure you they are in themselves quite a fortune. Well, uh, I suppose it's too much for human nature for me to expect two blessings at once. I had the fond, warm heart that loved me. Without the fortune that would have enabled us to live in comfort, but, but now, and that is almost within my grasp, the heart which was by far the most costly possession now lies buried in an untimely grave. Its bright influence, its glorious and noble aspirations, quenched forever. All is not yet lost, Miss Oakley. We must hope, and we must pray to find your lover again on this side of the grave. Oh, with all my heart, I pray it may be so. You will meet me then, as I request, to hear if I have any news for you. I have the will to do so, but who only knows if I may have the power. What do you mean? Well, I can't tell what it makes anxiety may do. I do not know, but a sick bed may be my resting place until I exchange it for a coffin. I feel my strength fail me, and I am scarcely able to totter to my chamber. Even now I am weak with apprehension and near mortal. Farewell, dear sir. I owe you my best thanks, not only for the trouble you have taken, but, but also for the kindly manner in which you have bestowed to me with the past. There are no thanks to you, Miss Oakley. And now I must bid you farewell. <laughs>
I feel lonely. How I wish at this very moment one of my admirers would call upon me just to while away the tedious moment. I wonder what the prospects of Major Bounce are. He's tolerably good looking, although middle aged. And within this, Mr. Mason Travers is always forcing his attentions upon me. But I know not whether I can bear to be living for any length of time. For he's a revolting looking man, with one eye that does east and the other do west. Then there's Mr. Lupin, a nice man, that's true. But he always persists in talking in such melancholy subjects. <sighs> Mark, what a short, sharp shower, to be sure. Fortunate for me, I did not pay my due visit to Mr. Sweeney Tall. Or in truth, I would have caught my death cold. Yes. <laughs> 
very special pie indeed that I only keep for colors and very dear friends. <laughs> but is there a profit made off of a two penny pie? I mean, dost thou put in a penny's worth of fat of calf? Now, brother, how do you suppose that I live? Well, then how much dost thou put in it? I thought things worse and I denied them all. I perceive thee to be a shrewd businessman, <laughs> Mrs. Lovett. <laughs> oh, what a pie, what a magnificent pie.
my existence a reality. Remember this place? The man who invited me here stood out. Before being plunged into the depths below. Merciful heaven! This is a piece of machinery to which a chain is fixed either side, driving to purpose murder and robbery. My pocketbook, gone. No more string of pearls! No, oh, all lost! The facts are clear enough. The owner of this shop is a robber and an assassin. I have not yet fallen to his inhuman designs. Oh! For the weak and defenseless, I will sell my life dearly. No, no, do not yield. Never mind, so false over when I find an instrument fit for the purpose. Yeah. 
loves anyone as evil as me. I regret the years I spent working hard to pay the rent. Now I've got a better plan. I have become an evil man. I'm evil. Quite the worst you've ever seen All my friends I've lost, I fear I've cut their throats from ear to ear I'm evil, I'm evil As evil can be I doubt if there's anyone As evil as me When I was a little boy Kindness often gave me joy Now I'm very proud to say I do my evil deed each day I'm evil, I'm evil As evil can be I doubt if there's anyone As evil as me When my life of crime is over and on earth I'm bad no more When my bones they've laid away Upon my stone I hope they'll say Yeah. 
Yes, Mr. Snow. I should have gone on that very first bell. Dear Mr. Snow.
goes to visit his old friends. Fred is not seen for a very long time. I shall return along. What a strange manner of speaking that respectable middle-aged woman has. And what a singular looking place, too. Nothing visible but darkness. I swear, if it weren't for the delicious other replies, it would be quite unbearable. Begin by silencing the babbling tongue of Tobias Rag. I need not take his life, for it may be used to me whereafter. However, a close concealment of the boy in the insane asylum of Jonas Fall should be sufficient enough. Yes. Now, Mistress Lovett, she, on the other hand, is an entirely different kettle of fish altogether. I've had an eye for her for quite some time now, but I fear she'd be planned to miss you. Ah, well, some poison, let's call it, skillfully administered, will take away any disposition in that area. Ah, Mistress Lovett. You gotta lay for a call. Sweeney told. Since I discover that you intend treachery, I shall insist on my fair share of the booty, an equal share of our mutual bloodshed. You shall have it. Oh, I will have it. Will? Yes. Every penny, every shilling. All right, then. If you'll only be patient, I shall balance account with you in a moment. Yes. 
12,000 pounds down to a fraction. But that's just 6,000 pounds for the each of us. There being just the two of us. Ah, bless you, Slavin. Forget your support lodging and clothes. Clothes? Clothes? But I haven't had a dress in these six months. And besides, you must have nothing for your education. Yes, for some time now, you have been totally dependent for by me after erecting furnaces and buying flour for your delicious pies, etc., etc. I'm afraid it leaves us down to 16 shillings, 4 pence, 3 farthings in my favour, and I do not intend on budging until it is paid in full. You plan to rob me, Sumini told. But you will find your sorrow. And I? I will have my due. Now, village who triumphs. I have the whip in my hand, and you will dance to mine too. Put your name on that deed, concerning the whole wealth of our mutual bludgeon, or else you will perish where you stand. You idiot! You should have known Sweeney Todd better than learned he's a man to calculate his chances. Behold! Oh. Now say your prayers, your last hour has come. Spare my life, as I have spent yours. I have been true to you, of all my guilty soul. You can't have the heart to kill me. Please, I will not delude my whole. Ah. Oh. Please, a lovely gentleman and lady once told me of a place where I could spend my days in peace and solitude. Let me see them again and beg them on my knees as I am to you now. Will you not lose your hold? Please, it's never too late to repeat. Find that perdition! No! I wonder if she 
the pie shop with his bill. I don't think I have to ask you who will assist me. I will, Miss Sedley. But we must be quick, as I would expect to attend any minute now. Then I'll be myself scarce. Go, go. I have footsteps. What are you staring at, boy? I wasn't staring, sir. Don't be impressed. Now tell me what you're doing. Nothing. Then finish the job and get started on something else at once. So, man, put away the casket you have in your hands. Ah! Now you listen to this. Oh. Now you do not make remarks which matters that don't concern you. You may think whatever you like, but you only say what I like. I won't be knocked about this man. I won't. Oh, you won't, won't you? <laughs> Have you forgotten your mother, boy? You say that you're proud of my mother, and I don't know what it is. But I cannot and will not believe you. Then. I'll leave you, come up what may. I'll go to sea. I'll go anywhere that saves to buy a place as this. Oh, you will, will you? Then shall we come to an understanding about this power I have over your mother? I am persuaded that while I'm in protector, you can do her no harm. <laughs> let me tell you, let me tell you of this power that you call it, that I possess over your mother. As you will, Mr. Tom. Do you remember last winter, Tobias? <coughs> yes, sir. It was a very cold winter, sir. Yes, cold, crude, harsh. The frost lasted for 18 weeks, and you, Tobias, you were starving. Your mother was employed to a lawyer at the temple. He was a cold, true, harsh man himself. He never forgave anyone for anything, thanks to your father, never will. Home was indeed desolate. A guinea was owing for rent. But mother got the money and paid it and obtained the situation where she is now. So you think, my boy. So you think. How a word in your ear. She took a candlestick to employ the payment. Oh, you lied and come to hold me here. My mother was a good woman. Oh, you got to get this on the staff. But it is true. And what is more, I can prove it. And if you continue with your conduct, I'll have a harm. Lion calumniator. It is my time you would prove me out to deal. This infamous charge placed upon an innocent woman has given me a nail of iron. I will throw off the yoke imposed upon you by me and... Where are you going? To the nearest magistrate. It is there I will denounce the name of Sweeney Todd and deliver it to the hands of justice. A cruel and cold-blooded murderer. Bias Rag will pronounce your doom.
Lady Todd, if my memory does not deceive you. You are right, Mr. Jonas Todd. You do not believe I am easily forgotten by those who have once met me. Ah, uh, true, true. You are not easily forgotten. <sighs> Tell us, what brings you here today? It seems I am most unfortunate with my boys and Mr. Paul. Although I show them the utmost care and lavish affection, as if I was their very father. As I say, I am most unfortunate. So what troubles you now, Mr. Tom? As before, Mr. Fogg, as before, the victim has shown such decided symptoms of insanity. It makes it absolutely necessary for me to place him under your care. What are these, um, symptoms does he? Rave. Oh, yes, indeed, he raves. And he raves on the most absurd nonsense in the world. Why, well, I can hear him speak, one would think that high, Sweeney Todd, were an absolute mm, murderer. A murderer? Yes, to all intents and purposes, a murderer. Why, who could make such an absurd assertion to think that I, Sweeney Todd, who have the milk of human vein, milk of human kindness throwing through every vein, who I, Sweeney Todd, who would not harm a single hair of one of God's great creatures. Quite, quite. I, Sweeney Todd, who would stoop over the stile to help the lame dog. Why, my very appearance would be sufficient enough to prove any one of my absolute sweet nature. Ah, as you said, tis absurd that anyone could confuse you with the man you really are. Now, as to the boy, how long do you suspect this malady to last? I will pay for 12 months' board and food. However, between you and I, I do not believe that the case will take that long. You think not, Mr. Tom? No. In fact, I think he will die suddenly, like symptoms. Ah, I shouldn't wonder if you did. And it's decidedly the best decision to keep any annoyance from friends, family, mothers, and fathers, and to make sure any other costs wouldn't be foolishly gone into. Well, you know our policies. We make no remarks. We ask no questions. It is a policies on which this establishment was founded upon, and as such we will continue to conduct it through which we hope to attain the patronage of our public. Unquestionably, most unquestionably. Now the boy, you may as well introduce him to me. Yes, indeed. I would have the greatest pleasure in the world in showing him to you. Tobias Rye, come into the room directly. Tobias Rye!
You, take this lad into your care. Place him in a straight waistcoat, shave his head, and confine him to one of our darker cells, as light seems to encourage his delirium. What have I done that I should be subjected to such cruel treatment? What have I done that I should be placed in this cell? Oh, would this be a madhouse? I am not mad. Have mercy on me. Hmm. You do nothing but bread and water. Have pity on me. The first symptoms of recovery will be for him to exonerate his master. For only a madman can such lay such absurd charges to one such as Sweeney Todd. Well, if madness is to know and that Sweeney Todd is indeed an assassin, then mad I am for it is true. Take him away. I swear he is one of the most vicious patients we have ever had. I will die to submit to you and your vile thugs. Then die, or no power will age you now. Yes. There is one, heaven, which fails not to secure the helpless and persecuted. Love. 
Yes, if Margaret Chester be dead, there is no harm in the acknowledgement. And a beautiful young lady is not to be shut out from the pale of all affection just because a lover to whom her heart first warmed is no more. She is here. Your servant, Miss Oakley. I rejoice again to see you. Pardon me, sir, if I dispense with all the common observances of courtesy. If my mind is ill at ease, tell me, I pray you at once, if you bring sadder plans and tidings. I have heard nothing, Miss Oakley, that can give you satisfaction concerning the fate of Martin Jester. Though I have suspicion that something serious indeed must have happened to him. But I hope with all my heart that the suspicion may be dissipated. I tell you this because, freely and frankly, dim and obscure as the hope is, I believe Mark has escaped the murderous hand raised against him. Believe me, Miss Oakley, if the sacrifice of my life would be enough, if it could in any way save you from the pain that you suffer, then it would, I assure you, sacrifice the most willingly. Oh, no. No, heaven knows enough has been sacrificed already. More than enough. Much more than enough. But do not suppose that I am ungrateful for the generous interest you take in me. No, believe me, Colonel Jeffrey. Among the few names that are enrolled in my breast, such to me will ever be honored. Yours will be found by that name. That I fear it will not be for very much longer. Do not speak despairingly. Have I not cause for despair? You have cause for grief, but scarcely for despair. I will ascertain the fate of Martin Jester or perish. You alarm me by those words, as well as by your manner of uttering them. Let me implore you to leave what attempts may be made to me to discover your lover's destiny. There may be danger even in inquiring for him, and therefore I ask you let that danger be mine alone. Well, I promise I shall attempt nothing that shall not have the possibility of success in Return here tomorrow at the same hour, and I'll divulge to you the scheme I have in view in regard to this terrible mystery. As you will. I will attend you at this hour tomorrow, and do not let despair overtake you. Farewell, good kind of friend. I love her, but she seems in no way willing to enchain our heart. Oh, alas, how sad it is for me that the woman who above all else I could wish to call my own, instead of being a joy to me, I have only encountered that she might impart a pain into my soul. Unless I am much mistaken, I address myself to Colonel Jeffrey. That is indeed my name, sir. May I inquire as to what yours may be? That is of no consequence at this moment. Let's just, let us just say that I am a friend in mind of your safety. What do you mean? Colonel Jeffrey, you are in grave danger. Indeed. From what may I ask? Follow me and I will show you your enemy. Wait, so I must first know who and what you are before I consent to be guided by a man who disguises his features by wearing a mask. I wear this mask for other purposes than uh, for other purposes than concealment, which are not judicious enough to, to explain at this moment. Unless you are more explicit, I cannot, I consider with safety to myself, consent to accompany you. I ask you again, sir, what is your name? And I repeat, I am a friend of yours and mind of your safety. Nevertheless, this assertion fails to move my scruples. But why should it, sir? Ah, oh, well, I guess you shan't have the information that I would give you that you otherwise could afford. Can it be? I am in fear and doubt as how to act in this most strange intercourse. Stay, friend, since you indeed say you are a friend of me. How do you know the token by which I can recognize your enmity? Great heavens! The string of pearls! Indeed, the string of pearls. Who are you, sir, and how came these pearls into your possession? Answer me, if I must know that without any further delay. Hasten with me to the shop of Sweeney Todd the barber, upon Fleet Street. There I will show you all evidence in his murder and it's responsibility for the murder of Mark and Jester, and also all the many slew in his years. Say you so? Then I have tarried too long. May my patience to fathom the mystery is so great that I wish our armored feet leave the wind behind us. Come, let no further time be lost by discourse. Son! Yes, he has the pearls in his possession. Perfect. Now I can denounce him and remove all name, guilt from the name Sweeney Todd. <laughs> but the prisoner, 
of the deed. There is much evidence. His unexplained absence from his home and the discovery of the pearls upon his person lead to no other supposition than that he is in some way connected with the mysterious affair which we are here to adjudicate. Now, what your motive was, prisoner, can be easily. What your motive was, prisoner, can be easily conceived. Your victim was the only bar between you and the object of your affection, Miss Joanna Oakley. My lord, circumstances are against me. I can make no defense, can call no witness, and the stranger from whom I received the pearls has not made his appearance. And my bare word alone is nothing. The state that some unknown person gave you the pearls in a public thoroughfare is so completely improbable that it cannot for a moment be accepted as the truth. Then I must sink into the grave with ignominy, and my name, which has hitherto been untarnished by this all, shall become the scorn of all honest men. There is but one chance of our death in prison, and it lies in this mysterious letter. But its purpose is so vague that I cannot for a moment give you any hope on that. Let the hand of justice be arrested ere the sentence is pronounced. A witness shall appear and confound the guilty in his moment of trial. I must tell you, prisoner, that that witness has yet to appear, and there is but one left. Let him stand for. Sweeney Todd, Sweeney Todd. I protest, my lord. You will not admit the evidence of this man. A man. Witness, make your deposition. May I, may I begin with by saying how I deeply regret to have to come and testify against one who has held the good opinion of the world. However, justice and duty compel me to do so. I, must, I will start off by saying I have recently taken a boy by the name of Tobias Rag into my apprenticeship. One moment, please. This boy, who has been taken into your services, has been mentioned in the earlier stages of this trial. Now, is he here? No, he is nowhere to be found, although a most diligent search has been made by the officers. It seems that since he was an accomplice of the prisoner, my he... lord, surely the unsupported testimony of this desired man will not be suffered to condemn me at this interruption of his ill for your judgment, prisoner. To be given the chance to reply in due season and receive every advantage that justice can yield. <laughs> Now, witness, continue with your attestation. Certain. It was his form. I saw it distinctly. Can the dead rise from the grave? What is this, witness? Why do you pause? The court is ready to hear the rest of your deposition. Your Honor, surely you do not expect me to testify with that figure gleaning in yonder window. Gone! Just the image of a distraught brain. My, my apologies, Your Honor. Just a moment of dizziness. Then we shall proceed. Let the string of pearls be produced. Show them to the witness. These are the same pearls that have been stated were taken from the murdered man. Now, witness, can you swear to them? To be sure, I can. And tell the court why you recognize them with such certainty. It's the clasp, Your Honor. It is so cleverly made, one can pick it out among a thousand others. And you have seen it in the possession of Mark and Jester? Shame! Shame how could you ask such a question when he's approaching the judgment seat as we speak? No, 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 utter our words for him. Don't say anything. Oh, your mind, for our road is being stained with blood. Blood! What lies is this? Witness, your words are incoherent and what? Your frantic gestures would lead us to believe that reason has resigned the throne to mad despair. Now, if your nerves are so unstrung by the pain of all which you have to then rest a while and we shall remove. Yes! Yes, it was a dark, death foul deed, Your Honor! But he not what you hear! 
Can't you see that the prisoner has bought off this victim? What? How can you stay here and suffer such corruptness? Oh, I fear it would come to this and to the accursed gold at which men sell their souls and part of their eternal salvation. Oh, oh my God! I am undone! All is lost and is useless to deny my guilt. For the very dead rise from the grave to prove that I, Sweeney Todd, am a murderer!
it spread like the flower, and the flower faded, and the man vanished. And then was said in those days, Woe to England, for Todd has escaped. Woe! Woe! Wild 
case we went to rescue me. For but a moment then, for I am just as wishful to apprehend this villain as you. How is it that we came to lose a scent when we were in such close pursuit? In truth, I am not at all quite sure how he did give us a slip. For once, I swear I could have touched him, if only my legs could have carried me faster. T'was in the marsh beyond the river, where I nearly had him in my clutches. But the devil obtained a sure piece of ground on which we trod upon, and so were his footsteps hastened. And he did reach the street, and disappear from our view, for we too were on the firm soil. Supposing he's returned to his, his barber shop on Fleet Street. They do say villains cannot restrain themselves from revisiting the places from which they carried out their dreadful crimes. Do you believe him to be such a fool? With half of the officers in London looking for him, why would he return to the, to the place where he was to go? As you say, kind Jarvis, it was but a foolish thought. How then are we to go about a way to find his feet and bring him to his final judgment? Perhaps you speak more sensibly than I first conceived. Knowing that us and others like us are looking for him, why would he not hide behind our disbelief and try and pull a clever piece of plot and return to his barber shop to get his ill gotten gains to fund himself whilst on the run? Come now, I'm rested and are eager to get once again on the trail of this inhuman brute. Then away to the barber shop on Fleet Street, where we hope to meet its evil owner and the settlement of our account. Where are the jewels? Oh, why can't I find them? Why did they just disappear? Oh, why can't I remember anything anymore? Oh, I know they're here. I hid them. It's the only place they could be. God, I can't remember. I'll just sit here and think a while. I'll remember it. Ah, oh, yes! Good day. Oh, well, well, good. You shave them a quick one if you don't. I'm afraid I can't attend you. I'm afraid I can't attend you at this hour. And why not, Frey? As you can see, the shop is not open for custom at this hour. Never mind. The door is open now. Give me a shave, I say, sir. My, my, my apologies, sir. Your Honor, please pray attend this. No, 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 no. This one right here. Much more fit for a judge. I beg your pardon, but I'm very nearsighted and I can't quite see your face clearly. But have I heard your voice before? I'm afraid you must be mistaken, sir. Oh, no mistake. Ever since my eyes began to fail me, I've relied more heavily on my ears for my memory. I think I remember it. I believe I was once the foreman on a jury. Ah, oh, that must be it. This will never do. Sir, we wait but a moment. I will get some more hot water from the other room. <laughs>
shocking jester who presided from death by noon, returns to found the guilty and protect the innocent. Murderer taught us dead, and villainy has earned its just reward. 